Okay, so good evening and Shavua Tov, everyone. Uh, this is our shir for this week and it's going to be about Parashat Pinchas. And let's just first remind ourselves of the, the, back, the background story, what's going on here. Pinchas appears at the end of the previous parasha, Balak, and again in the beginning of this parasha, which is named after him. And the story, the previous parasha, was all about Balak and Bil'am, and Bil'am came to curse, but he, all the most beautiful blessings imaginable came out of his mouth because Hashem put them there. And so the, the more the parasha, the previous parasha develops, the more we feel good about ourselves, that we're such a wonderful, amazing people, we have so much kedusha and so much sni'ud, and, and we're so holy and so wonderful. And, and with each and every blessing, this feeling increases. Uh, and then immediately after this whole story ends, and even in the end, it's Bilam himself speaking. It's not even God putting words into his mouth. He's converted himself. And he speaks so highly of us. And then we're told very briefly that after all this, we came to a place called Shittim, which is a very significant name. And then the Moabite women came. And according to Midrashim, it was Bilam who sent them. But according to Pshat, they were just there. And then the, the men, the Jewish men, started whoring with them. And not only that, but they immediately, as, as it always happens, the Moabite women uh, encouraged the Jewish men to also worship their idol, which was Baal Peor. And of course, all this was very, very bad. And then to make things even worse, it is said that uh, the chieftain, the Nasi, of the tribe of Shimon, Zimri, actually uh, hoard with this one particular woman, who was the, the most important woman there, uh, just in front of the oil moed, the tabernacle. And, uh, and all this was very terrible, and nobody knew what, knew what to do. And even Moshe himself, he, it was said that he forgot a certain halacha, which is a very interesting halacha, because even if he wouldn't have forgotten it, he wasn't allowed to teach it, but he, he, he didn't even remember it, which, was, which is the halacha that says that if a Jewish man is having intercourse with a non-Jewish woman, then it's permissible for someone who's a zealot, and the word here is kanai, kanaim, to, to kill them. But it's a halacha that must never be taught. It's only... It can only happen if if someone takes it upon himself to do so. It's a, it has to be something spontaneous. It cannot be taught. And Moshe himself didn't even remember this. Something it was so shocking. Everything that happened there. And but it's exactly what happened. What happened was that a certain man, Pinchas, who was a priest, Kohen, and the grandson of Aharon, uh, he came and took a spear and killed the two people, the Jewish men and the non-Jewish women who were doing this terrible transgression. And it's one of the most, uh, in a way, shocking or violent incidents uh, in the Torah. And a lot of people, modern people with our sensibilities, and we're very much uh, adverse to such spontaneous acts of violence, and, and for a good reason, because we don't want anarchy. Um, if I have a hard time with this. And then this parasha, which is named after this man, Pinchas, uh, actually Hashem starts by, by um, blessing him and, and saying that he, was, that he did such a wonderful thing. And he says, and the verse that he says is that in Hebrew it goes, Israel. He has turned back my wrath from the Israelites, because I was very, Hashem says I was very angry with the Israelites. But he has... He has turned back my wrath. He made me be. He made me not be angry anymore. And um, by how by displaying among them, and, and the, here what it says in Hebrew is kinati, by displaying his jealousy or being jealous in my place. I was jealous. And here we have, now, this whole class now today, this evening, is going to be about jealousy. But it's a very tricky word, and it's a very tricky concept. And it's actually, in Hebrew, it's one word, in English it can be several words. 
One word would be jealousy, and the other word would be zeal. Being a zealot is a kanai, but also someone who's jealous. So maybe, I don't know in English, if zeal and jealousy, there is a slight similarity if they're connected. In Hebrew, they're absolutely connected. It's the same root, and they go together. So we're going to use Pinchas and his story, and his zeal, which was blessed by God and, and, and seen very high, spoken very highly of, we're going to try and learn from this about the place of jealousy in relationships, in, a, in, in marital relationships, in a couple, a man and a woman. Because the, this is really the background here. The background here is that there is a man and a woman, but they're doing something very bad, which is the opposite of a holy matrimony, of blessed, kosher, good, positive relationships, because they're not married, because she's not Jewish, because it's all very profane. And he, and the fact that he has this kind of zeal or jealousy, again, in Hebrew it's the same word, against this means also that he has, uh, that the, 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 there's a flip side, and the flip side is that he's very much passionate about the, the proper kind of marriage and the proper kind of relationship that should happen. So there's a deep connection between relationships and the and the kedusha element the holy element of relationships of marriage and jealousy so that's what we want to explore here in one of the translations kinati that he was jealous was just uh, i found this i think it's an art scroll that he displaying his passion for me and then the continuation of the verse is i did not wipe out the israelite people in my passion again in hebrew it has to do with Kin'ah, jealousy or zeal. So we want to, again, we want to go deeply into this concept, this word, kin'ah, and ask a very simple question. Is kin'ah, jealousy or zeal? First and foremost, jealousy we want to talk about, and then zeal will connect to this. Is it good or is it bad? That's the simple question. The answer isn't going to be simple, but the question is simple. Is jealousy a good thing or is jealousy a bad thing? And we can very, you know, easily find answers for why jealousy is bad and why jealousy is good. And that probably means that there's a good kind of jealousy and a bad kind of jealousy. But that also we need to try and define and try and, and, and sort of delineate this whole concept and where it starts, where it ends, and what's good about it, what's bad about it, and so on. So <clears throat> something, the Torah really helps us in this. In another place, in a different parsha, a few weeks ago, we read parsha. Naso. And in this parsha, one of the many topics of the parsha was the topic of the sota. Sota is the woman who may or may not have been uh, in, who may, may or may have not been unfaithful to her husband. And it's unclear, and there's this whole ceremony done in the temple to try and clarify whether she was uh, unfaithful or not. And the, in fact, the, just the word, the name Sota, immediately connects to our story, because as I said before, the place that the whole Pinchas incident takes place is called Shitim. Shitim and Sota come from the same root. Sota is written not with a Samech, but with a Sin. In the, the tractate in the Gemara is written with a Samech. But the original word in the Tanakh, in the Torah, is Sota with a Sin. So Sin can be, can be also Shin. So sota could be shota, and has to do with shitim. This is a very important root. It's the root that has to do with the shtut, which is nonsense, being nonsensical. There could be an unholy shtut, which is your yetzer hara, that causes you to do bad things. And there, there's also a shtut de gdusha, which is a positive kind of shtut, of nonsensical folly. So shtut is folly. Shtut also has to do with straying off the proper path. Listot, that the sota, is like someone who strays off the proper path. And in Shittim, the Israelites, the Jewish men, strayed off the path with the Moabite women. So listot is to stray off the path, and it also has to do with being folly. And also, this is the root of the word Satan, right? The devil. Satan, or an, a wicked angel, someone who makes you stray off the path. So all this has to, so the sota is somehow connected to this place Shittim. And it has to do with straying off the proper path. So um, when the, the, the whole halacha of the sota is described, 
then it's just, it said that um, her husband could have something called Ruach Kina. Ruach Kina, again in art school, is translated as a fit of jealousy, but literally it means a spirit of jealousy. There's a kind of spirit, Ruach, of jealousy that passes through him, and he feels that his wife may have been unfaithful. That's the, the, it appears to be the pshat. In Chazal's hands, it becomes something completely different, and it becomes a, 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 ver, a very um, organized uh, act of, in front of witnesses, telling her that she shouldn't be in a certain place, with a very, in a closed place, she shouldn't be in, a, in, in closed doors, behind closed doors, with a very particular person. It's very unemotional. It's not a fit of jealousy. It's not a spirit of jealousy. In Chazal, halachically, it's something very, very rational. He has to, there has to be a sort of hava amina, a possibility that she's actually having, could have a relationship with a very particular person, and then he tells her in front of witnesses, they have to call the witnesses. But the pshat, the way it's written in the Torah, if we don't have Chazal, and we don't have their reading, and we don't have halacha, then we have this image of a man who suddenly has this spirit of jealousy, ruach kina, or a fit of jealousy, as, the, as, as, as one of the translations says. And then, and also in the end of this whole story, this whole thing, this whole sota incident, this whole sota issue or topic is called Torah Knaot, the Torah of jealousy. So this is very strange. And then Chazal say, because the word ruach kina, spirit of jealousy, appears twice, then they say something very interesting. They add a question. The question is, is it a, this kind of spirit, or fit, or emotion of jealousy? Is it a ruach tum'a, or a ruach tahara? Is it a spirit of purity, or a spirit of impurity? Now, just having this question in Chazal, that's a very deep, beautiful thing to look at. They're, they're really looking at the emotion jealousy, because ruach kina, spirit of jealousy, that's like saying the emotion of jealousy that passes through me. And, and they're asking, is this emotion, is this ruach, a spirit of purity or of impurity? And just having this question, we, we should say, we, we're, we, it invites us to say that elu ve'elu elokim chayim. These and these are the words of the living God. They're both real, they're both true. And the fact that Chazal have this question, and both options are, you know, available to them, it means there's truth to both. And the fact that it, and the, 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 the Sota uh, uh, text talks, says twice that he has a spirit of jealousy and she was unfaithful. And she, he has a spirit of jealousy and she wasn't unfaithful. Just this duality reflects, again, that this duality is very real. So that tells us, that gives us the first clue, that there is a positive kind of jealousy, a pure jealousy, and there is a negative kind of jealousy, an impure jealousy, a ruach tum'a, ruach tahara. So, um, <clears throat> so that's, that's, that gives us the first, the first clue. Now, just to be clear, um, we... There's something I didn't say before, I should, I should have said it, and I'm going to say it now, is just looking at this word jealousy, I said that there's, it has to do with either jealousy or zeal, but we have to make it a little bit more clear before we continue. We, and, and that is that there's really at least three meanings to, to be jealous. So one meaning is to be jealous of someone in the sense that I'm jealous of someone who has a bigger house than I do. And, and this is a very negative kind of jealousy. And, and, uh, and uh, well, at least on a material level. It's, it's always explained that if on, a, on a material level, you shouldn't be jealous of anyone. One should be content with one's lot. So what I have, this is good, and I shouldn't be jealous. Spiritually, I should be jealous of other people because uh, I shouldn't be content with my lot, with the little Torah I know, with the little mitzvah that I do, with the little tzedakah that I give. No spiritually or, or how, it, how developed I am spiritually. Phys on, on a material level, I shouldn't be jealous. On a spiritual level, I should be jealous. It's a good kind of jealousy. This is called a, a jealousy of writers, of, of, of wise men, 
makes in, increases their wisdom because they're they're competing in a good way with one another. So this is this is the jealousy of the regular jealousy of other people of what they have materially, which is then bad, or what they have spiritually, which is then a good jealousy. But that's not the jealousy we're talking about. This is just to be clear. The other jealousy we are talking about is jealousy, which is which is like the jealousy of the relationship, what we just spoke about, of the husband being jealous for his wife. He's not jealous of any particular person or man. He's not jealous of someone having, um, uh, who knowing more than him or having more property than him. He, this is, in Hebrew, it's called not lekane be, which is to be jealous of someone, again, what he has. It's called lekane le. This is a husband jealous for his wife, and, and, and the more we come to our generation, we, it's very symmetrical. It's also women being jealous of their husbands. It has to do with the very big change that has happened, that, uh, that, um, that men only have one wife, and which means that they, they, it gives more room for the woman, for the wife, to be also jealous regarding her husband. Today, it's very obvious that men and women can be equally jealous regarding their relationship. So that's the jealousy we're talking about, just to be clear. And then the third kind of jealousy which is connected, that's what we're trying to un understand, is what we call zeal. A zealot is a kanai, and that appears, and, and that's very similar to a jealousy, of the relationship kind of jealousy, except it doesn't go uh, with, it doesn't, it, it doesn't, it's not directed towards one's spouse, but it's directed towards a certain ideal or value, usually something religious or something very holy. It doesn't have to be religious, something could be religious-like, could be uh, an ideology. If someone is very as a zealot regarding their ideology or belief or value or flag or group or or religion, then we call them. And it, and it's very they're they're jealous of not of it not being abused, of it not being uh, um, misrepresented, or it's being cheapened and so on and it's very very similar to a husband being jealous of his wife and so pinchas being jealous for god's truth and god's mitzvot and he but actually pinchas was was in a way he was jealous of the um ideal of a holy matrimony so he's really the connection he's really the connecting point between a re relationship jealousy and a jealousy for a religious or a spiritual ideal and so on. So that's, that's what we're exploring. So we have to go back to this. And, uh, and of course, just to make the question even more uh, you know, acute, is the fact that he was a priest and that later he was, he was, he was given something called Brit Shalom. He said that he, the word peace is used regarding what he did, although it doesn't see, it's not a peaceful act, it's a very unpeaceful act. But the fact that he was a guardian, that he was jealous of the holiness of matrimony, meant that in the long run, he increased peace or love in the world, the proper kind of love. So the, the, the big riddle here again is that Pinchas, being a priest, priests have to do with loving kindness. Kohen has to do with the sphere of chesed, of loving kindness, and they increased love in the world. So how come the, uh, the person who was the most zealot uh, in, the, in the Torah, probably, we can think in the whole five books of, later on maybe, but in the five books of Moses, this is probably the most, the, the sharpest act of personal uh, zeal. So the fact that he has, he's, as a figure, as a priestly figure, he's connected with love, again, goes back to our question for this evening, which is, how can how do love and jealousy go together right this is the whole thing can they go together should they go together of course we can think about the verse from song of songs aza kamavet ahava kasha kishol kina love is as powerful as death aza kamavet ahava and 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 then equally and it goes together kasha kishol kina kina jealousy is as hard or as difficult as hell or as the underworld. And the question is, do they go together or are they the opposite? So many people feel that jealousy is the opposite of love, and many people feel that love without jealousy is not love. So it's amazing, just amazing. It's not only Chazal arguing whether the Ruach Kina, the spirit of jealousy, is something pure or impure. We just go in, go in the street 
and ask people, do they think jealousy in relationships is a good thing or a bad thing? And you'll find them divided like across the board completely with the major group of people telling you very simply that of course jealousy is a part of love and I want my spouse to be jealous and if they're not jealous, it's something's wrong. Maybe they don't love me as they should. And then you have a whole other group who tell you, no, jealousy is, is the opposite of love. That's like being, that's like thinking of your partner as, as belonging to you like an object. And that's very negative. So going back to Chazal, arguing whether this is a pure or impure spirit or emotion, and you have this also reflected in our own society. So that's a good, a very good question to explore. So um, let's, let's try and figure this out. If Chazal are telling us that there's a, two kinds of, of Ruach Kin'ah, that must mean that Elu ve'elo divrei Elohim chayim, both opinions are true, uh, should also, we, could it also be true regarding the, the people in the street that we just did a virtual survey among them to ask them what they think. So both are true, but it's a question of putting it in order. There are two kinds of jealousy. So let's start with a bad kind of jealousy. There is a bad kind of jealousy. And the people who say that jealousy is the opposite of love, they're not absolutely wrong. There's something they think, it's the question of what they have in mind when they, they use the word jealousy. But the word jealousy that they have in mind, right, probably, is a negative kind of jealousy. And this is the jealousy that the, it does not come out of love, about thinking of my spouse as a subject that is a person in and of themselves that I care and I love and I cherish our togetherness and our intimacy and so on. It's thinking about them as really, consciously or subconsciously, as my property, as my belonging, as belonging to me. And this is again something very beautiful and interesting in Hebrew, that the word kin'ah, the main two letters here are kufnun, right? Aleph and hey, all the letters of ehevi, aleph, hey, vav, yud, are not as, as fundamental to any root that they're in. And they're almost like vowels. So you have, you're left with two consonants, really, which are kuf and nun. And they're the, 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 the two main consonants also of kinyan. Kinyan is a property, a belonging, something that belongs to me. And so this is a very negative feeling. If, if you're trying to limit the movement of your spouse in a way that you don't really think about them and you don't think about the relationships, it's just about you having control and you um, uh, wanting things to be, you know, to, you, you want to be in charge and you want to make sure that, that, that the other person is, bows down to you and, and doesn't have any free room to, to make their own decisions. And also you're not trusting them. It goes together with being very suspicious of them. And suspicion is the very opposite of a positive, healthy, relationship to the other person, because then, then you don't treat their soul, their neshama, their inwardness respectfully, because you don't trust them, you don't give them, you don't trust them to make good decisions and to be faithful to you. And you don't trust the love that you have also, the relationship. So all this is a very, very negative kind of, of jealousy. And there's a verse in Mishle, in Proverbs, that actually says uh, that kin'ah is, is akin to, or is identical to, uh, the, uh, the bones rotting. In Hebrew, it's rakav atzamot kin'ah. Kin'ah, jealousy, is like, is like the, my bones rotting inside me. It can drive you crazy. It's a very negative verse describing a very negative kind of jealousy. However, if we were just left with this, then it would be a very wrong portrayal of the place of jealousy in relationships. Because the other side, the flip side of this, is that there is actually a very good kind of jealousy, which doesn't come out of objectifying the partner, and it doesn't come from trying to control the partner, or of trying to think of my partner, uh, my spouse, as belonging to me, but it's really, it absolutely goes together with love, and it's inseparable from love. And that is the feeling of, of cherishing so deeply the kind of holy bond that we've created that this is so intimate and so holy and so precious that the, the, the thought of it being made profane and it being broken and it being, um, uh, you know, again, made profane in the sense that it's, 
it's it's tossed out or thrown out or or uncherished then that is is equally powerful as the love itself it, it, it goes together with for example the a lot of people ask if I love God if I love Hashem why do I need to have fear we all know that there's love and fear but a lot of people say well, why do I need fear if I love God so much and one of the most beautiful explanations for a proper kind a Hasidic explanation for the proper kind of fear of God is that fear, the proper fear is the fear that my, that I will lose my love for God or that I will lose this loving relationship that I have with God, that I, that I cool down, that I become distant from Hashem, that I forget Hashem. And this is the fear. It's not a fear of God the punisher. It's not a fear of my own sin even. It's, it's the fear of what my sinning will do. My sinning will disconnect me from God. It's very similar. There's a fear and a jealousy of losing the love that we have. And this is, very, and this is why in the Song of Songs, Azaka Mavet Ava, Kasha Kish Ol Kinha, they go together, corresponding, paralleling one another, because it absolutely goes together. And, and, and the people, the other group in our survey, that said that if there's no jealousy, then, the, it, then there's a, the love is also you know, blemished or missing, they're all, also absolutely true. And now something very nice in Hebrew in Gematria, is that if you take the word kina, right, kuf, nun, alef, hey, and you do the Gematria, it equals 12 times love, right? Kin'a is ahava, 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 ahava. <laughs> 12 times love is kin'a. And, and why 12, you would say? Then just a little something numerical, right? Every three-letter word has six combinations. Every four-letter word has 24 combinations. But if those four-letter, if, if two of those four letters are the same, and that's the case in ahava, right? Because there's two hey. Same goes for God's name, Yud Kei Vav Kei. That it's not 24 combinations, it's 12 combinations. So you can say that the 12 combinations of Ahava, you can write Ahava in 12 combinations, all varieties of love, all combinations, permutations of love, all 12 combinations, all put together, that's kina, that's jealousy. In this case, jealousy is somehow even higher than, than, um, than kina. Now we said before, that kina has to do with kinyan, which is property. But even the word kinyan uh, could be something very, uh, very positive. Uh, why? Because, for example, well, in, our, in, in, in the Torah, kinyan is one of the words for creating the world. Right? In Kiddush Levana, we say, um, uh, Baruch, we bless the moon, and we say, Baruch Osech, who made you, Baruch Yotzrech, who created you. Baruch Boreh, who created you ex nihilo, it's an, another verb. And then the ultimate, the final, highest word is Baruch Konech. And you would think it's he who bought you. But Hashem didn't buy the moon, or he didn't buy the world. It's also said that Hashem is Konech Shamaim Ve'aretz. That means, that's one of the words we're creating, but it's actually the highest word. It has to do with the most intimate connection and bond of the Creator and His creation. And it has to do, we said that the two letters that kin'a and kinyan have in common, the two consonants, are kufnun. Just those two letters, kufnun, create the word, the word ken, not as in yes, that's kaf. Ken, kufnun, is nest. Nest is an image for relationships, for a, building a home, nesting. And the, the couple are like two lovebirds, creating a love nest. And the nest is like a home. It's very intimate, it's a very intimate image. And also, in, in mo both modern Hebrew and English, you could say that if someone, you know, captivates your heart and you fall in love with him, or not just fall in love with him, you, just, you fall for him even in a non-romantic way, just another person, you, you could say, he bought me. He, he bought me. He, what he said was so beautiful, he just, he bought me there, then and there. And it's not a negative thing. And, and also, belonging is not a negative thing. Right? So even the word, that we, even the, the, how we used to explain the negative kind of jealousy, which was the jealousy is associated, connected with kinyan, property or belonging, that also could be, it depends on how you look at it. If you objectify the other person, then this act of belonging or of being someone's property, of course, that's very negative. But if you think about belonging in the sense of it, heimish, heimish, you know, homely feeling, 
that I belong to some, and he belongs to me. It's, it's, it's the most, it's the sweetest, uh, most emotion there is. And it's something interesting historically to say about this is that the, I think the main reason we said that if we go and make a survey in the street, there's a whole group that would say jealousy is the worst thing and it's the opposite of love. Where did they get this idea from? So we said that there, there's, some tra- there's some truth to this, but how come they don't see the other side of this? And I think this historically, this is coming from Marx. The thinker Marx, the Jewish turned Christian, turned very secular uh, thinker, one of the major, the most important thinkers that created secularism, he and his friends and followers, they saw the whole institution of marriage and family as, as completely have to, having to do with property. They said, why, why did marriage was created in the first place? Because the father needed to know who his son was so that he's, he could make sure that his belongings, his property would inherit. And then the wife became the belonging of the husband and all this. And the reason they think in this way, completely in this way, is that, um, is that they're materialist. They're all very materialistic in their thinking. And they can't see the intimate subjective aspect of belonging. And this brings me to mind something very that I've been walking around ever since I was a young man or a, a teenager. That it's been going around with me as something that I think is very vital for this for this cheer and this idea. And when I was so when I was young, there was this TV series about high school kids, and then there was one episode that has made a very strong impression on me. And in that episode, the teacher there was a teacher in the class, and the teacher wanted to teach. The, the, the students' responsibility. And they each got a, 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 an unboiled egg. And he, he told them, you have to take this egg with you wherever you go for the following week. And of course, if you don't take care of it, it breaks very easily. So you have to maybe build a, a bag or and maybe put some, you know, uh, something fluffy to guard it and so on. You have to, to really take care of it. And you have to take it wherever you're going. You go to the movies, you're going to parties. You have to take it wherever you go. And you have to bring it back safe and unbroken next week. And that will teach you about responsibility. Very beautiful thing. And maybe teachers should really actually do this. And, and then what struck me was that the first thing that all the students did, he didn't tell them to do this, but the first thing they did was they each, they drew a face on the egg. And they gave it like a, it became like a person. And this is something amazing for me because this tells you that when something belongs to you, so the, the Marxists would say, now he becomes an object instead of a subject. But this little image for coming from this TV episode uh, is illustrated for me that it's, it, it, I, I really op- it operates the other way around. An object becomes a subject once it belongs to you. You care about it, you give it a face. And you go to a, you go to a store and there's a, 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 a row of identical objects and you take one of them and then it belongs to you and then you don't want to replace it for the other object because now it, you, you, you feel its face, its subjectivity, it becomes part of you. So it's the very opposite. When something belongs to you, when, you're, when there's a ken, a nest, a kinyan, a bond created, then it, it, you could see the, if it's wrong, if it doesn't work properly, then you treat the spouse as an object. But if you, if you don't think in these terms and you listen to what happens when you bond is that the other person becomes a, a subject. So this is, uh, this is a beautiful image for me of how belonging, and this goes together with jealousy, right? Because the jealousy is that now that we have this bond that we see each other's face, faces in such a way that no one else can see because I see your inner face because because we became very intimate and I, we share secrets and we share a life and we share our weaknesses with one another. And this gives us a kind of very strong intimacy and bond. The, the idea that this would be broken or made profane is unbearable. And, and that makes me jealous of the relationship and of my partner in a very, very good and, and, uh, and positive way. So, um, going back to the story and to Pinchas and to what, ha- what happened there, so there's uh, um, something to add here. The Hashem said that Pinchas, Heshiv Chamati, he has 
turned back my wrath, right? Now, the word wrath, there's quite a few words for wrath in Hebrew, right? There's kas, and zam, and rogez, and in this case, it's chayma. Chayma is, is one of the more extreme words for wrath, just like wrath in English, right? It's one of the more extreme words for anger. So, again, you could say, you could think that Hashem was angry at us, but now that we've sweetened jealousy, or at least we differentiated between the negative kind of jealousy, which objectifies the partner, and which wants to control them, and which has really to, to do with their, your, own, your own fears and your own inability to be trustful and to give room to the other one, to the other person. And the other kind of very positive jealousy, we can now try and connect more the jealousy with zeal, right? Because as we said, if the love is powerful, if the is a zaka mavit ahava, then the kina should also be equally strong, just like the word that we have here, wrath. So God talks about kinati, my jealousy or zeal, and he talks about chemati, another interesting, beautiful uh, thing in Hebrew. Uh, so we have chema. Chema is, uh, is, as I said, wrath or anger. It has to do with the word cham, which means hot or warm, because when you get angry, you get hot. So if, if this is negative, it's negative. But in this, in this case, it's very positive. It's a very positive kind of heat. So something very beautiful. If you, there are, if you if look for the word wall, in English, there's only one word, it's wall. But in, in Hebrew, there are quite a few words, right? There's kotel in the, the Western wall. And there are two more words for wall, which are kir, that's the simplest word, and choma. Kir and choma. There's something very interesting is going with these two words. Kir has to do with kol, which is coldness. And choma has to do with chom, which is warmth. So it's just like we have two kinds of jealousy, we have two kinds of walls. And it goes together because jealousy is creating a nest, a boundary, a wall around the relationship. So if this is a negative kind of jealousy, it would be a kir, a cold wall. And it's very cold, it's unintimate, it's very, because it doesn't come, it doesn't emerge or grow out of the warmth, the warm heart of the relationships. But if it's a good wall, right? It, it, the survey we would make, if, if people would say walls are bad, the, the same people would say jealousy is bad, they would say walls are bad. And the people who would say jealousy is good, they would say walls are good, the boundaries, they guard you. And again, we have these two aspects. There's a good wall, there's a bad wall, which is called kir, kor, and there's a good wall, which is choma, chom. It preserves the heat. It makes sure, it makes sure the heat doesn't dissipate, doesn't get lost. And, and this is what we have here. So when Hashem is saying that Pinchas, Heshiv Chamati, Chaymati, He has brought back my wrath, or turned back my wrath, we can also read this as, He brought back my wall, the positive, warm kind of wall, the Choma, that preserves the heat of the relationship. So the, again, the outer aspects, look, when you look at it from a distance, you, look, you see a wall. And from the distance, you can't see if it's a kir or a choma, if it's cold or warm, if it comes out of, if it's like a prison or is it like a, like a, like a home. But when you look at it from the inside, and then you see that the, this act of zeal of this zealot uh, is coming from a very deep and positive kind of, of warmth. He's trying to preserve the positive, good wall and the good, positive and good um, jealousy that guards, preserves the heat of relationships. And if there's no jealousy in the relationships, then it's also very cold. It's cold if there's a negative kind of jealousy, and it's also cold if there's no jealousy. You have to have the positive good kind of jealousy, which builds like a firewall. That's another beautiful image that is used in another, in one of the prophets, that Hashem says that He will be, for the Jewish people, chomat esh. I will be a firewall Again, Choma, not Kir or Kotel. I will be a Chomat Esh. I will create a firewall around you that guards you. It's a beautiful image of the positive kind of jealousy, which again, like fire, has to do with zeal. Otherwise, it isn't real. The love isn't real. It's not authentic. It's not candid. So, so this is very important. Now, just to wrap this all up, 
uh, this whole thing happens in shittim, right? And we said shittim has to do with straying off their path or of being folly in a negative way. And the thing is that, I mentioned before, there's a holy folly. And the holy folly is when you do things that are irrational, they don't make sense. If you think about them rationally, you wouldn't do them. But it's very important, very, and the Torah is full of holy folly stories. What Tamar did was holy folly, when Rivka taught her son to disguise himself as Esav. It's a lot of things that they do, the patriarchs and the matriarchs, and also in Chazar, and of course in Hasidic stories all the time, is what they do is holy folly. They do things that are crazy, they dance and they sing, and all of Hasidut is one big holy folly, because rationally you wouldn't be a Hasid, you would just be a kosher Jew, and you wouldn't go and, and do it but a dude, and you wouldn't go and dance and do, you know, you t- t- turn on your head, over your head, and you wouldn't do farbrengens because it's irrational. But shtud de Gdusha is very important. And the, whole, and the whole point of this shiul is that being jealous is also a kind, jealous in a good way regarding your spouse is also a holy folly. And, and that's the only thing that can really protect us. If we would say that the, the, the Israelites whoring with the Moabite women was a yetzerara, and, and then the, we rectified this by being very you know, kosher and, and, and doing what we should do, not what we shouldn't do, uh, he would just come back. You would have children that would be again attracted to idol worship or to immodest things, and, and because there's something very attractive about shtut, shtut, folly, straying off the path, that's a vital part of the way the soul works. So you have to be a holy madman, a holy shote. And being a holy madman is being going crazy for God and crazy for your relationship. And that also goes with being jealous, is you can't stand uh, when, when the holiness of the, and it has to do, with, of course, with modesty. And, you know, people say, why are, why are the, 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 the tea and the religious people or the Haredim people, why are they so crazy with their tzniut? They're so tzanua. And you can be, you know, in the middle, and you say, okay, the word doesn't, you know, it's not, the world is not just a nudist beach that you have to go, you go, in, go in the opposite direction. You can be somewhere in the middle. But that's, that's not understanding the reason the religious people go crazy for the tzniut thing. And of course, you can also, just like there's a negative kind of jealousy, you can also go crazy in a negative way for tzniut. But if you, if you do it in a right way that comes out of, out of your, the inside of you and remembering the inside of the other person, and it goes with trust, and it doesn't go with coercion, it goes with a lot of room, because the negative jealousy is when you're, when you're not giving the other person room, you're trying to control them. But if you don't have this control freak element, which makes it bad, and you don't have the objectifying element, again, both jealousy and snew, they really go together, because snew is all about creating this firewall around the holy aspect of of uh, of the of the intimate union so but but if so if you don't have all those negative things of the the cold walls of being uh detached and being and not having trust and being objectifying and being a control freak if you take all this out of the equation then you should and that's what, that's what the, the generally the religious orthodox world does, is go crazy for tzniut and for, the in, for, for guarding the intimacy in a, very, in a very good way. You have to distill it, you have to refine it, so that all the negative elements of the negative kind of jealousy are not there. But if you do this kind of refining, you're left with a passionate jealousy, which is very, very positive. It's a sign of life. It's a sign of being really connected to what's holy about Judaism and what's holy about the Torah and what's holy about relationships and what's holy about the body and what's holy about intimacy and not being mild about it, not being cool about it. If you're cool about it, you, then that's the worst thing in the world because you're missing out on the heat of life in a very deep way and the heat of the soul and the heat of what's meaningful in this world. And so, so again, the only way to rectify what happened in Shittim to rectify the shtut de klipa, the klipa, an impure kind of folly uh, that caused the Israelites to go after the Moabite women, is 
it can only be rectified with a holy kind of craziness and folly, which is going all the way with this kind of very good jealousy, which is really an aspect of love. It just absolutely goes together with love. They two, the two cannot be separated. They absolutely go, go um, together. And that strengthens the Brit Shalom, the covenant of peace between a man and a woman and between ourselves and Hashem, we the woman, he the man. It's all one big relationship that needs to be guarded with the firewall of Kedusha jealousy. So that's our Hitbonanut uh, for, for this week. And now I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to stop the recording. And I'm going to take myself out of spotlight. And I'm going to start a new recording. Do we have this also? And I'm going to unmute all of you. And now you can raise your hands. And uh, let me just first look if someone wrote something in the chat. So first I'm going to answer the bracha wrote to me. In both cases, is there a basis for jealousy or only in one, two of the cases? Talking about the sota. So uh, is, is Hazal hinting in the Zota that there's a basis? Obviously, there's a basis or sh the woman wouldn't be brought be before the client. So there's a basis for this. So in one, she's absolved and she dr when she drinks the water and she, if she, what, if she wasn't uh, uh, guilty and then she has, she conceives and has a child and the, uh, then the, uh, um, but the other one, obviously, if she's guilty, but is Hazal saying in both of these cases that there's an underlying... Uh, well, clearly, if she wasn't guilty, then the suspicion of the husband was unmerited. And uh, so w one oh, of okay. the... So if it, there, there's a... Uh -huh. and, and so on a simple level, if he was right, then it was a good emotion. And if he was bad, it was, a, it was his own... That was the negative kind. He was just being controlling okay. or in, imposing and so on. And so I, I thought the idea that is that the good kind of jealousy is, is merited. It's, it has a good cause. And the negative yeah. kind of jealousy is, uh, is negative. And the whole Sota tractate starts with uh, trying to teach the husbands who study this tractate not to be jealous and to realize yeah. that not, not to be jealous in a negative way. And to teach yeah. them that the whole tractate begins with uh, t teaching the husband that everything that his wife does or doesn't do, it's a reflection of him. And, he got, and he, whatever he's getting or not getting, it's exactly what he deserves. So he should leave her alone and he should work on rectifying himself. If, something is, if she's not giving him something he needs, he should do tshuva. And if she's giving him something he, he, that's unpleasant, if she's angry, whatever, it's also, he also should do tshuva. And either way, either way that's how the whole track did begin in the Gemara. And so that's, that all of this is trying to refine yeah. Of getting to the right, proper, pure kind of jealousy. Okay, so Hazal, I was the Hazal was hinting that there had been behavior that was was less than, or else she wouldn't have been brought in both cases, even if she's guilty or not guilty. I always thought that the behavior had come to a point where th there might be something underlying, but you're saying. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all. No, in the case of the Sota, that's also true. That yeah. the fact that she was um, yeah, behind closed doors with someone for a particular for a certain set of time, that's all. That's already wrong. Either way, right. either way, there was something wrong. Otherwise, she wouldn't have been summoned. All this wouldn't have happened. Right. That's yeah, what but, I'm there, but that's a, that's another topic. Now, here we wanted to right. raise the topic of the jealousy. And that's all. So there's a basis. And Hazal was hinting there's a basis in both cases. Even even if she's absolved or not absolved. Yeah, yeah. Again, that's if you yeah. Again, this topic for today is not the sota, but it was I used it as a yeah. But it's uh, in the case of the sota, yeah. If there was something, but the question it was how bad was this? Yeah, if just being behind those doors, it's not so bad. The question was, was she really, in, was there infidelity or not? Okay, thank you. Anyone else want to ask a question? Someone else wrote to me, Diane wrote to me. Thank you very much. Okay. But, um, 
Okay, if you don't have any questions, then it's late, at least in Israel. Uh, so we're going to say goodbye, and uh, I'll see you next week.